Faith Dimensions invites you to understand more fully the subject of righteousness by faith. This is a series of 20 Christ-centered messages from the dynamic new book and study guide entitled 95 Theses by Morris Vinden. Now, with today's message on perfection, here is Pastor Morris Vinden. I have a heavy-duty question for you today. Are you a perfectionist? Do you think God is a perfectionist? What does perfect mean in the Bible? Are we supposed to be perfect? Can anyone be perfect? I remember hearing a group of Christians talking about this subject one time till midnight. And uh, after they had talked all this time, one person was kind of looking far off, and they said, it makes you kind of want to go out and get drunk. Well, that's been the reaction of many people when it comes to perfection. And yet there are some who feel that this is a very important topic. What does the Bible have to say about it? Let's take a look, because it invariably is going to come up when you talk about the subject of righteousness by faith. The truth is that there are some people who are so vicious about the subject of perfection that they are at each other's throats trying to prove that we're supposed to be perfect. Figure that one out. Probably one of the key texts that comes to uh, focus on this topic is Matthew 5, verse 48. This is right in the middle of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And there he says these interesting words, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Oh my, that perfect? What is meant here? Sometimes people have tried to explain this text away, rationalize it, do away with it, ignore it, and then probably one of the latest insights that I've come across, to call it by another name. They say it doesn't mean perfect in the original language in which it was written. It means only mature. Only mature. As though that's less than perfect? What does that word suggest? I'm going to suggest uh, right off to begin with here on this topic that um, there are three kinds of perfection in the Bible. Some of them are spoken of specifically and some of them are simply uh, inherent in the thoughts. Three kinds of perfection. Number one, perfect in birth. That's the newborn Christian. He can be perfect. Secondly, perfect in growth. And thirdly, perfect in maturity. Now let's take a look at these three. We know that a newborn baby down at the hospital can be perfect. In fact, that's one of the first things that is asked when a new one comes into the world. Does it have the ten fingers and the ten toes? Is everything all right? Yes, it's a perfect baby. And the baby lies in his crib as the days go by and makes gurgly, bubbly sounds and uh, goes coo and goo, and we think it's cute. But if 20 years later that same individual is making the same sounds, we'd really worry. You can have a two-year-old that sits on the curb and uh, makes noises to his neighbor friends across the street like this, <laughs> and we think it's funny. But if they're still doing that 20 years later, we think it's tragic. So you can have perfect in birth. You can have a Christian who has a brand new Christian just been born again. That's perfect in birth. 
the thief on the cross, who received salvation at the very last moment of his life, perfect in birth. And that's normal. But the second one is very important, to be perfect in growth. Now, who's going to decide that? Who's going to measure it? How can we? Even in the physical world, uh, everyone grows at a different rate. People mature at different ages. Even there's a difference between the gender as far as maturity is concerned. Girls mature faster than boys. In my family, we are what, we, what are known as late bloomers, I guess. I hated it. I grew up so slow that I was the shortest one in the class, and I didn't like that. And there were other guys in my school that were growing beards when I didn't even know what a whisker was. So there are differences in maturity as far as uh, rate of growth. And there are differences in the Christian life. Some people are born stubborn. They are strong-willed. They have a backbone like gristle. And learning to find out how weak they are is hard work. And if the growth in the Christian life is allowing God to let us realize how weak we really are so that we can be strong in his strength, it's a slow process for the stubborn willed person. Then you have the people who are born weak-willed, and they become prostitutes or publicans, as the Bible called the cheating tax collectors. And God says they go into the kingdom of heaven before the other people, the strong people, the religious people. What was he saying? That these people found it easier to rely on God, easier to admit their weakness, easier to look for power above them instead of power within them. And perhaps this difference can make a variation in terms of how people grow. Whatever the factors, we know that everyone grows at a different rate, and only God knows what's normal for you, even in the spiritual realm. But for each individual, it is possible to be perfect in growth. Jesus himself said, first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. Now we're getting to the third one, perfect in maturity. Which means that maturity doesn't become a weaker word than perfect, it becomes a stronger word than perfect. You can be perfect as a baby and still not be mature yet. You can be perfect in growth for your rate or your particular situation, still not be mature yet. But when you come to the full corn in the ear, following Jesus' illustration, then you have something that's not only perfect in birth and growth, but perfect in maturity. So in Matthew 5, 48, when Jesus said, be ye therefore perfect, and it really means be ye therefore mature, it is talking about ultimate perfection, the final perfection, perfect in maturity. Some people call this perfection of character or perfect character. And that's a common usage among some Christians. I think it's one and the same, perfect maturity. Well, let's take a look at how perfect is perfect. Let's notice a few texts from Scripture. 1 John 2, verse 1, Jesus says through the uh, beloved apostle, These things write I unto you, that ye sin not. So it's possible to not sin. The Bible isn't playing games with us. It's telling us that it's possible to not sin. So it's possible to be perfect enough to stop sinning, apparently, according to Scripture. While we are growing, the Bible makes it clear that there's an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So if we fail and fall, we're forgiven. 
but there's still power to not sin. In John, the eighth chapter, verse 11, we have the story of the woman, who apparently was Mary Magdalene, dragged to Jesus, caught in the very act of adultery, and they were going to stone her, but instead they left in the presence of Jesus. And finally, Mary and Jesus were alone there, and he said to her, where are your accusers? Doesn't anyone condemn you? She said, no one, Lord. He said, neither, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more? Was he playing games with her? Was he telling something that wasn't possible? Or does the Bible allow that there is power available to sin no more. The Bible is very clear on this. So, uh, perfect in growth, perfect in maturity, can include sinning no more. Does that mean we wouldn't need a Savior? No, we'll always need a Savior because of our past sins. And as far as this life is concerned, we need a Savior because we are sinners by nature right up until Jesus comes. But it's possible to know the power of God to stop sinning, according to Scripture. And that would be somewhere in the realm of perfection, wouldn't it? Now, there is a mighty text that uh, says it very clearly in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5. It says, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Have you ever had trouble with your imagination? Have you ever had trouble with your thoughts? This text speaks to that. It is possible to know the power of God, to control our imagination and our thoughts. That's scripture on the subject. And that sounds like something in the realm of perfection when it comes to sin and victory and power. Obedience is possible in this life. Obedience is necessary in this life. Perfection is possible. Perfection is important. The Bible speaks of it. But there's something we need to realize, and that is that this department, the perfection department, is all God's department, not ours. Now, if you trace through the Old Testament, you'll discover that uh, there were kings and leaders who were known for their perfect heart, even though they didn't always do righteously or do what was right. This is interesting. Apparently it is possible to have a heart that is perfect toward God in terms of love and devotion and confidence and trusting Him, loyalty, a heart that is more interested in relationship with Him than anything else, and still not be doing righteously all the time. That's possible. The Old Testament also reverses it. Check it out sometime. There were kings in the Old Testament time who did perfectly, but they didn't have a perfect heart. So apparently it is possible to produce outwardly external perfection that looks good to men, even goes down on the record in the Bible but to not have a perfect heart toward God. And if you follow through on some of these who were relying upon their morality and their external performance, they ended up in tragedy because of their heart problem. They didn't have a heart that was perfect toward God or toward God at all, apparently. So you can study the topic through those glasses. Perfect heart, even though we don't always do what's right, or always doing what's right without a perfect heart. Which would you choose if you had a choice to make? Now, here's another principle that is very significant. No one who is ever perfect or comes close to it 
is going to talk about it or say so. Job, the ninth chapter, verse 20, gives us this great principle. It basically says, if I say I am perfect, that proves that I'm perverse or that I'm a liar. So be careful the next time you're tempted to say you're perfect. Well, you say there aren't very many people that do that. I guess not, but there are some. I've met some of them. Years ago, I, uh, I met a man who went out of his way to come and see me. He'd heard that I was interested in the great theme of righteousness by faith. And he said, you know, I've been wanting to meet you. He said, I understand you're kind of a sin specialist. And I uh, said, well, I don't know about that, but I'm interested in righteousness by faith. He said, so am I. In fact, he said, I haven't sinned for five years. And I thought he was being funny. So I was getting ready to laugh when I realized he was serious. And I continued to listen. Yes, he said, I haven't sinned for five years, and I can still remember the last sin that left. What was it? It was pride. <laughs> pride? And then I was certain that he was being funny, and I was ready to really laugh, but he was serious. No, the Bible spoke to that man's problem. If I say I'm perfect, that proves me a liar. Years went by, in fact, a number of years. And years later, I met the same man thousands of miles away in the front steps of a church in Southern California. He said, do you remember me? I said, how could I forget you? He said, do you remember what I told you? Yes, and it's still true, still true. And I knew right there that this man still had a problem. Well, as we follow through on this study, I want to underscore for your encouragement that perfection is God's work, not ours. That's why it is safe to not spend a whole lot of time talking about it or working on it or dwelling on it. I think personally that it's the devil who tries to get us involved in this discussion and that it's only safe to talk about perfection once over easy. Don't spend a lot of time on it because invariably, if you spend much time talking about perfection, it's going to focus your attention right in on where do you suppose? On yourself. How far have I come? How much farther do I have to go? I wonder if I'm going to make it in time for the end of the world. And the moment my attention is focused in on myself, that moment there's no hope of any perfection, whatever is possible, because the power for perfection and overcoming and obedience, all of it comes from looking to Jesus. And when we look at ourselves, that short circuits the look of power, looking away from ourselves to Jesus. Someone said, I uh, looked at Jesus and the dove of peace flew in. I looked at the dove and he flew away again. Let's paraphrase it. I looked at Jesus and his power came in, power for victory. I looked at the victory and it went away again. You never succeed by focusing on yourself. One day we were having a Bible camp with a group of young people. And we got to talking about some of this. So I got a broom out of the kitchen. And I took the broom and I balanced it on my hand. Have you ever tried it? Well, there's a clue as to how to do it. When you balance a broom, you never look at you. You don't even look at your hand that's balancing the broom. You look up at the top of the broom. That's the only way you can balance the broom. I invited some of the young fellows to come up and balance the broom by looking at the hand or at the bottom of the broom, and they couldn't do it. Pretty good illustration 
of looking away from ourselves to Jesus because perfection is his department. Uh, I think one of my favorite texts in all the Bible on this subject is found in Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21. Look it up and underline it in your Bible. It sounds like a benediction, but it has great truth in it. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. Notice those strong words, make you perfect. How perfect? Perfect in every good work. Does that sound rather complete? Yes. Well, what does that include? To do his will. Jesus said one time, I delight to do thy will. Yea, thy law is within my heart. He was quoting an Old Testament passage. That includes obeying God's law. Perfect in every good work to do his will. But what's the method? Working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. It's his work. He does the work. All we can do is look away from ourselves to him and trust him to do the work. It's his department. Now, the Apostle Paul was great on this. He talked about being more than conquerors through him who loved us. Not just overcoming and being victorious, but being more than conquerors. He knew that obedience and victory and overcoming is possible, is important, is necessary. You don't wait until Jesus comes for these things. You seek Jesus and let him do his work now. But he went to a church in Galatia. He brought converts to Christ. He went on his way. Then he got bad reports. And he wrote a letter to the Galatians, trying to help them out. And probably one of the pivot points in his letter is found in Galatians, the third chapter, verse 3. He says, you beloved idiots of Galatia. That's what the modern translation says, and that's rather accurate according to the original. You beloved idiots, having begun in the spirit, do you expect to be made perfect by the flesh? In other words, you became Christians through the power of God and the Holy Spirit. Now someone's confusing you, focusing your attention on perfection, and more than that, focusing your attention on yourselves and your own flesh, your own abilities. You expect to become perfect that way? He says, you beloved idiots. I don't want to be an idiot, even a beloved one. Do you? So let's listen to the message of Galatia. And remember that it's all God's work from beginning to end. How am I to abide in Christ? In the same way I received him at first. The just shall live by faith. Those who have been justified by faith live by faith as well, totally. Obedience comes all by faith in another and his power. Overcoming all by faith. Perfection, whatever is available, all by faith. It's all his work. Well, when we get into this subject, there's one final question that people often ask. They say, who's done it? If you really believe that the Bible teaches that we can be perfect, who's done it? I even had someone come up and ask me that one time. They understood that I was interested in the great theme of righteousness through faith in Christ. And they said to me, have you done it? Are you perfect? There's only one answer to that question. It's none of your business. It's none of your business who's ever done it. We never look at each other and judge each other as to where we are in the Christian life. That's God's business, his department only God knows. One thing I do know, that the Apostle Paul, who was one of the greatest Christians who ever lived, 
after he'd been a Christian for 14 years, said, I am the chief sinner. Because the closer he got to Christ, the more unworthy he felt. Doesn't mean that he was continuing to fall and fail and sin. He's also the one who talked about being more than a conqueror. But it means that the closer you come to Jesus, the quieter you get about your own performance and your own track record. As we look away from ourselves to Jesus, let us take courage. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Shall we pray? Dear Father in heaven, we're thankful that you are in charge of the perfection department. Save us, we pray, from useless discussions and long hours on that. Rebuke the enemy who would like to have us focus in on ourselves. We give you praise and honor and glory for your might and your power and your victory in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, that's the good news for the planet Earth, where there are four things that God does not know. God does not know a sin he does not hate. God does not know a sinner he does not love. God does not know a sin he won't forgive. And God does not know a better time than now.